Um, I'm very glad to be back in Olomouc, and I'm more than glad to see some familiar faces. I'm already three years in the Czech Republic, and Palacki University became uh, another place that we cooperate. And it was mentioned before the Center uh, for Jewish Studies was glad to adopt a nice idea, something that started by a wonderful lady, a member of the Israeli parliament, Knesset, Dr. Eliza Lavi. And I became on the side also a little bit of an expert on funny noida because of that. Uh, so it's not about me, but we are glad as an embassy in Czech Republic um, to sponsor, to support activities of this site. And I'm always glad to travel and to arrive to Olomouc. I'm glad that we have another wonderful person here, Hugo Maron. He was mentioned, and uh, you will have an opportunity to listen to him tomorrow. Yes? Or day after tomorrow? Day after tomorrow. And I'm glad also to learn uh, from Ivana that another Israeli institution, uh, David Yelin Academy of Education, will start cooperation with your center. So it's a good news. You are here, ladies. We were looking for you. There were cold coffees there in the cafeteria. Name out. Brochot about. Welcome. Feel at home. I feel at home here. So, uh, thank you all. Thank you for giving, giving us this opportunity. And I'm not sure it's not my role to invite Aliza, but if it's okay with you, please. Hello. First of all, thank you to Ivana. Where are you? Hi. Thank you very much. It's an honor, and I'm very happy to be here and speak about Fanny uh, Noida, about my research. Um, it took me uh, years to publish uh, this book and to understand uh, the treasure that I have in my hands. And for me to be here and to speak about Fanny is like a dream because the first time I heard about Fanny, I found that um, someone stole my history as a Jewish woman. How come that um, me, Eliza Lavi, I was uh, born in Israel, I know how to read and how to write, I grew up in the Orthodox uh, community, and no one, no one told me about Fanny Noida. And actually, everything uh, was uh, started um, when I had a lot of questions about my place in the Jewish world as a woman. I have a lot of questions together with my friends, and we didn't have any support from rabbis or spiritual leaders to help us to find our own way in between questions in modern time. And it took us a while to understand that sometimes in your life, you need to make your own research by yourself and don't wait that other people will tell you the answers. And that's what happened to me. After many years as a social activist, especially in women's issues, I understood that I can't continue my life without find answers. So after I finished my dissertation at Bar Ilan University and Zmira Mivarech was that time the, how can I say, the, the, the chief of uh, everything in our university. And I remember the day, and it's funny that you are here, my dear, but I remember the day that I finished my dissertation 
and I felt that I can't continue my research. My dissertation was about uh, gender in the newsroom. And I wrote its communication field, and as I told you, I totally find myself uh, in another area uh, with questions that nothing connected to my research as an academic uh, figure. And I remember the day that you recommend me to continue, you know, Lisa, you have to now write in your field and publish your, your dissertation as a book, you remember? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you write, you write. But I couldn't continue, you know, without find answers to my heavy, heavy, heavy questions. So I went to find answers. And um, I asked actually what other women during the ages, periods did. How, why they, I mean, and how um, beliefs in, in things, especially during the time that Jewish women, most of them, didn't know Hebrew. When they went to the synagogue, they didn't understand the prayer. And I asked myself, what did they do? I mean, who told them what to do? And there is no translation that time. And um, how come that they continue their life uh, as Jewish women? And um, it was really um, a huge question uh, for me. And I went to make my own research. And then, step by step, I found um, answers, and more than that, experience and uh, knowledge that I wasn't familiar with. And first of all, I was amazed of the brave of these women that create their own dialogue with the creator in their language and in their way of life. And it's happened everywhere in the Jewish diaspora, in Milan and in French, and in German, also in Libya, and Morocco, Turkey, and many different languages in the local language that the women spoke. And it means that they took their responsibility, their needs in their hands. They didn't uh, wait that someone else will do it. So two things was bother me. One thing is, wow, I mean, who were these women? But more than that, why me, Aliza Lavi, are not familiar with these amazing, amazing prayers? And then, after a long, long, long journey, it took me uh, three years of research, and I sat in museums, archives, very old archives, in synagogues, I spoke with a lot of uh, women, testimonies, and men, etc., etc., and I found an amazing world of Jewish women prayers from periods that I really, really, really didn't believe because most of the research, including in our university, wrote that Jewish women didn't write. And actually, the oldest and ancient prayer was written uh, by Paula Batrabi Avraham, Paula, the daughter of Avraham from Italy, in the end of the 13th century, 13th, 13th century, and she wrote it in Hebrew. And I asked myself, I mean, how and why in my time, in our time, that we live in the modern life, women are not allowed to write prayers? And, and, and what's happened during the centuries? And what happened to all the knowledge that belonged to uh, uh, belongs to uh, women uh, uh, action uh, uh, fields. And then I met Fanny Noida. And uh, it took me a, a while because one of my uh, assistant uh, told me, Elisa, I remember that I wrote something and then I got an answer that there is a book that uh, was written here in Czechia, in the Czech Republic, actually in, in Moravia, by women. You must find it. It took me three years to find 
this book. And in the end, I found it in Jerusalem, in the International Library in, in, in uh, Givat Ram in, in Jerusalem. And I, I was shocked because it was there, and I, you know, I looked after this book uh, in all, in everywhere, and I found uh, this book. Uh, nobody opened it before, and of course, it's, it was written in old German, uh, but I found small words in Hebrew in between the words. It took me a lot of time to find a translator to translate me because it's very heavy language, it's old language. And I looked after someone, especially woman, that know good Hebrew, good uh, old German, and know how to translate uh, the words and the prayers uh, because it's not that easy to translate and to bring it back. My uh, work is, I'm trying to bring back a lot of knowledge and more than that, answers from the past to the present because it's a lot of knowledge to use it as tools in our days. So in the end of the long, long, long research, I found the Katya and actually, after many years that we worked together, she told me that she was born here, and she was the first baby that was born, her two parents, her father was a doctor and her mother was a nurse in Bergen-Belsen, and after the war was finished, they came back to Olomo, and she was the first baby that was born in the camp after the, the war, but she didn't tell me in the beginning. It took five years, for her to tell me all the story. So, you know, sometime in your life, destiny is not only an excuse, it's happened. Uh, because it was for Katya also her way back to Judaism, to Jewish culture, because she grew up with a lot of questions and we are not going to open it, but for her it was also, you know, step by step. So thank to Katya Mano, I uh, have all the translation to Hebrew. But in the beginning of our process, she um, gave me a little bit of idea what it's all about. So uh, Fanny Noida, uh, she uh, grew up in uh, Moavia, and uh, she married a rabbi here in Lostache, close to here. And she moved to live together with him in Lostice. I hope I say the word Lostice, 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 Lostice. Lostice. Okay. So for me, everything was okay. I, I didn't know because I couldn't find anything about her or about the book or about the prayers in the books or encyclopedia or research. So I didn't know anything about her instead of the book that I found in the library. But from the book, I understood that she did amazing, amazing, amazing work. And she said that she wrote this book, a prayer book, especially for women and girls. And this is, you have to understand something amazing because she is the first, she is pioneer. There is no one else that did it like this before her. So for the first time in our history, Woman wrote a special, special book for women and girls, prayer book for them. And in the introduction, she said, I'm doing this before two, before, because of two reasons. One reason, it's not enough prayer, prayers for women. And second thing she said, I want that Jewish women will continue prayer in their language. Don't forget that this time we're talking about 1850, 1855, the book was published and I assume it took her a while to write this book. But that time, the, the, the ghetto, the Jewish ghetto was, uh, you know, suddenly the borders were open and uh, women, you know, they could go to the 
academy and to the opera and to learn and I didn't know, didn't want to uh, speak anymore in Yiddish. And all the trainers, the prayers, the understanding, the books that they had were in Yiddish, the old Jewish language. But this woman that time, when the ghetto was open, they want to, uh, you know, wanted to speak uh, German. They want to be like all the other. So on one hand, it was very, very good, you know, that we can be like our neighbors. But on the other hand, Fanny was afraid. What will be about Jewish education for the girls, for the women? When they go to the synagogue, they are going, they're, they're going not to even understand one word because it's in Hebrew. Nobody teach Jewish education for the women. And what will be? And, and, and she was very, very afraid. And that's why she wrote this amazing, amazing, amazing book. As, as I said, for the first, first time, she wrote prayers concerning the Jewish prayer book, but she had a personal prayers um, for special moments in uh, women's uh, life. And this is something that you can't compare in other, I mean, for the first time, it was, you know, she wrote a prayer for a girl that had a bat mitzvah. Nothing else was written before. Uh, she wrote amazing, amazing, amazing uh, prayer for a mother that her son served in the army. And when I saw this prayer, I was shocked. 1855. And after translation, this amazing book that, by the way, what, now in Israel, this is the most, most, most popular prayer I am a mother of a soldier that uh, served in a special uh, unit. Uh, it took to him and his friend one year and a half as a trainer. And in the end of uh, in the, the end of the course, after we got one year and a half, uh, all the mothers together we stood up and prayed together Fanny's prayer. And I was so amazed by that because I, I can't, you know, uh, think about the fact that Fanny will, in, will think about it that one day women will pray her prayer in Hebrew in Jewish state. So don't forget that, as I said before, I didn't even know something about her. Who was she? How came that she wrote a book like this? Who gave her the permission? Because it's against, you know, woman, right, prayer, book. Who, how, I mean, who gave her the permission? And I found that she published this book in Prague, in the most, most, most orthodox publisher house. So it means that the community and the spiritual leaders that time gave her support. And you can't compare it to other, and you're familiar with our history as Jewish women. So a lot of questions to ask, but no one to answer. And also I found some um, testimonies and also found some uh, critiques that uh, were written about Fanny's book uh, in 1856 by priests here in this area. So it means that this book was very, very popular among people here in this area. So after many years of research, um, I found 28 editions all over the world. So it means that this book was very, very, very popular, even uh, Amos Oz or uh, um, other writers, Hebrew writers that you know are very famous and maybe you're familiar with some of them. Amos Oz is one of uh, will be very happy to have a tw two, uh, 28 uh, you know editions. So more questions to ask: If she was so so popular, why you know we are not familiar 
with her name at least, with the prayers, with the book. So again, someone, as I said, stole my, my history. And if Fanny was like, you know, a figure like this and wrote a book like this, maybe there were other Fannies that we are not familiar with. So I took 14 uh, prayers and I uh, added to my book uh, a Jewish uh, women's uh, prayer book that uh, was published uh, in Israel 10 years ago. And these 14, uh, year, uh, 14 prayers um, became a phenomenon in Israel. Everybody asked me about these prayers and about Fanny and I felt that I, I don't have answers to myself also but to, to explain her work and the phenomena and the fact that she wrote all this, this book. So again, I went back to, to Katya and I said, you know, Katya, 14 prayers is not, is not enough. Let's translate all the book. So to translate all the book, it took us 10 years uh, because we try to translate very, very sensitive and to take the Hebrew word, words uh, that we had till 1855. We didn't want to add modern word to Fanny's work and to translate from German, old German to Hebrew. On one hand, to think about Fanny, but on the other hand, to think about our young generation because I want to bring back Fanny's prayers to our young generation. So it took us a while and in Hebrew, we have a list of uh, the words when the word come to the Hebrew language. So we, uh, we worked very, very hard to use only the words that we had till 1855. And it was really step by step, and thank God the book uh, was uh, published uh, in Hebrew. So during my research in these 10 years, I say to myself, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I don't know anything about funny. I couldn't find it in the encyclopedia. So maybe, Maybe I'll come to this area, to Olomo, uh, at least to, to, to see, to, to, to meet someone. It was maybe nonsense, but for me, I said to myself, okay, at least I will see the view or the panorama from the window that she wrote to understand something about her. And I came and I met a ludic stip from uh, Lostice that came back after many years in Canada. And uh, he decided with his 10 fingers and a little help to uh, um, uh, uh, to, come to fix the synagogue in, uh, in Lostice. The synagogue was destroyed. Uh, the Nazis came and made a supermarket in the synagogue and everything was destroyed there. And together with the use, he start uh, to fix the synagogue and uh, he asked the, um, the children and the youth to bring memories uh, from uh, the Jewish people that were lived uh, before the Holocaust in the village and he did a very nice work, social work with the youth in Lostice and we met and I told him about Fanny and via him I met uh, Dina uh, in the States that she suddenly also uh, met uh, Fanny's book in uh, America and we became th uh, three of us, Ludic, uh, Dina Bernard and myself as a team of Fanny. My mother said that Fanny came to your mind and I don't know, maybe uh, she can't sleep in her, uh, <laughs> yeah, in her grave because otherwise I can't explain how it comes and uh, it's happened that Dina translated the book to English and, and published it, but she uh, made it like uh, poetry. Uh, in Hebrew, it's same like Fanny wrote. And then Ludwig did um, translate uh, and, and made it happen that the book now is uh, in your language. So let's, let's read a little bit because, I mean, uh, I, I feel that we need to um, understand her amazing work via the, her words. So let, maybe we'll start uh, from the introduction and maybe, Ivana, can you uh, write, can you read it for us in your language? Yes. And the one that uh, want to have it in English, we have it also 
in the source page. In, yes, let's start from the introduction, just to understand who she was, why she do all this for women, and what she asked for the mother, mothers in the community to do. From, from the introduction, number one. působí na nitroženy povznášivě, posvěcuje její pocity a vede k hlubšímu prožívání uctívání Boha. Nicméně má mít liturgie skutečně onen blahodárný vliv, chceme-li, aby všechna ušlechtilá slova a tóny zaznívající našimi modlitbami udeřily na struny ženského nitra o ním v pravdě povznášejícím a zušlechtujícím způsobem, je nezbytným předpokladem také znalost a pochopení jazyka hebrejské modlitby. Protože jinak slyšíme pouze slova, nikoli však slovo. Zvuky nám doléhají pouze do uší, ne však do srdcí, a modlíme-li se vůbec, pak pouze svými rty, ne však z hlouby duše a všechny svaté zpěvy Sionu, nádherné žalmy jakéhosi Davida a všechny vznešené modlitby lidu Izraele, naplněné v rouci duchovností, pro nás zůstanou zapečetněným svitkem. Proč by naše dcery, které dnes věnují tolik úsilí a času hře na klavír, opernímu zpěvu a výuce moderních jazyků, což jsou všechno skutečnosti diktované víceméně módou, proč by nemohli věnovat denně alespoň jedinou hodinku také studiu svatého jazyka, té důstojné pramátivší mluvy, která je navíc klíčem k veškerým pokladům ducha a srdce. Pokladům, které do jisté knihy nazývané celým světem knihou knih, zanesl a uložil sám znešený panovník světu. Proč se alespoň maličko nevěnovat jazyku, který je dnes mimo těch spolehlivým poutem spojujícím všechny články do nejzaších koutů světa roztroušeného Izraela? Jednoho jestli v, jedno jestli v Cincinnati, Bombaji, Tunisu, Varšavě, ve Vídni nebo v Londýně, všude po celičké zemi zaznívá v židovských templech onen jazyk, kterým, se člověk, kterým s člověkem hovořil už Bůh na Sinaji. 1855. She, she, she is brilliant, she knows everything. She's familiar with uh, Jewish uh, code, I mean, we call it halacha. She, she knows the books, she's familiar with the, with, I mean, I mean she, she, think about it. She, she didn't have Google. She couldn't say something and learn. She has knowledge, she had the knowledge and she had uh, books and, and she, she, she was, I mean, Amazing. She was really, 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 and we say it in Hebrew, Talmidah Chachama. I mean, she was, she was like a rabbi. Her husband was a rabbi. Her father was also a rabbi. Uh, her brother was a rabbi in Vienna. She came from a rabbinical uh, family. So she, I mean, was really a 
well educated in, in what we say, uh, the Torah, the Bible uh, education, but more than that, uh, um, secular education, she had both. And she used her uh, knowledge and her God inspiration and she wrote prayers in amazing, amazing, amazing way. And in the introduction, we're familiar with her responsibility for the girls and women around her. I assume that she was a wife of a rabbi and maybe many, many women came to ask her advice and to tell her, her their intimate request story in bad days, in good days, and she, she she saw, she was like a prophet because she saw the change coming from the Yiddish neglected arena to the opportunity to be part with the community that surround, surround you. And she, she understood that there is no enough Jewish education and no knowledge in Hebrew and she asked ask the mother at least to teach the daughters Hebrew because without Hebrew there is no future from Jewish aspect. And when she nominated all the other places, it means she knew that in Bombay and in Morocco and in Varsha there are Jewish life. By the way, I'm not going to open it, but she didn't say Jerusalem. And that time, we know that Montefiore, Montefiore made his research fifth time and there were people in Jerusalem that came to Jerusalem to build the Jewish home and they came back. And, and she didn't mention it in the introduction and also in the book. I assume that she see her future here in this area. It really was a dream for the people here to see the culture and to understand that they can have a good life here and future and to write. And she wrote a lot of letters to her brother that uh, well, was that time the rab a rabbi in, in, uh, in Vienna. Unfortunately, when I went to find these letters that I was told that she wrote to him, I couldn't find them because the archive of the yeshiva was uh, destroyed by the, by the Nazis. So nothing to work with, just to imagine. And I have a lot of imagination discussions with Fanny to try to understand her work. On the other hand, I looked after testimonies in Israel and I try to meet uh, women that were born here in this area. So I went to Ruth Bondi. I'm sure you're familiar with Ruth Bondi. And Ruth Bondi told me, Aliza, me, prayers. I came from the Shomer Tzair. We didn't pray, don't speak with us. And then I went to a house of all the people in one of the kibbutzim in the north that I was told there are many women that were born in this area. So I went to speak with them and they told me, Aliza, you're crazy? We used to pray in Hebrew. Hebrew, this, we are Zionists, we pray in Hebrew. We are not familiar with uh, Fanny's book. So I was really sugar. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, 28 editions I found. And in Israel, no one testimony. How come? One hand is Ruth Bondi, the other hand, uh, ultra-Orthodox women that came back to Hebrew because they learn Hebrew, they want to come to Israel, they want to establish the, a, a new uh, a country to the Jewish people. So in between, I couldn't find. And don't forget that everything was after the Holocaust. So the Holocaust destroyed from the archive till the people that we lost a lot of knowledge, unfortunately. And then my book was published in English via Random House. So that time I had opportunities to speak out of Israel. Many, many, many communities in the States, in Canada, in Europe. And one lecturer in Canada gave me the answer. 
In the end of the lecture, I spoke about funny. In the end of the lecture, I met a woman. She stood up, 87 years old, and she told me, now you're going to come with me to my home. So I came to her home, and I sat in her salon, and she went to the basement and came back with very old bag, um, uh, bag. And she told me, you see this bag? I was a child in Frankfurt, and during the war, my parents sent to me to London together with the train, the kids' uh, train, to uh, the house of uh, children that there are no parents for them or someone to help them. And after months, I got this bag, together with some pictures and clothes and photographs of, of my mother and also Fanny's book. And till the lecture today, I didn't even know she said that someone else know about Fanny. But for me, this is my mother's book that were her grandmother's book. And she told me I prayer from this prayer book every morning. So I was shocked and she either. And via her, I met women in Canada that ran away before the Holocaust. And via them, I try to understand the, the picture and the fact that why in Israel I couldn't find, because in Israel, many women came after the Holocaust. So the next testimony was actually in my visit here. When I met Ludek five years ago, Ludek uh, brought me to this university and I met, I think I met, uh, you mean, um, what's her name? Um, the one from Vienna? The, uh, Louisa. Yeah, Louisa. And after when he took me to the train, he told me, I'm, you must see something else. And he took me to the parking place when the synagogue, the old synagogue, uh, was, was there. And I stood there. And then I saw in the corner a group of uh, young people. So I say to myself, I'm sure they are Jewish. What other people are, are, are you know, doing here? So I went to speak with them, you know, Israeli. I went to speak with them. There were uh, Jewish from America that came to Israel to a special program. And the, in this program, they spent months in Israel and months in this area. They are coming to fix uh, um, in archives and, uh, yes, in other... They're trying to find a lot of uh, pieces from, from the history. And I told them, what are you doing here? And they told me, we have one student in this program that his grandmother was born in Lostice, and I don't know why, but he wants to go and visit this. Uh, and I spoke with the guy, and I asked him a question, and like a Shiga, I asked him, do you know Fanny Noida? And look at me, uh, what she wants from me? But after a while, her ma her, his mother wrote to me, and via this meeting, I met her mother. And her mother, she is the, in, after, in Lostice, there were three survivors after the Holocaust. And his grandmother was uh, one of the, these three survivors. And when I spoke with these women after this meeting, there is no, as I say, destiny or not destiny, but I see that so many things, you know, came together to understand Fanny's history. But via his grandmother, I learned that this book was so popular in this area. And she told me that she took this book, Fanny's book, uh, together with her everywhere. And then when the community was moved to the camp here, Theresienstadt, she took this book with her. But then when they moved to Auschwitz, they weren't allowed to have 
books, Judaism books, and Talit, and Tfilin, and all the other stuff. And she told me this was the bad day in my life. And then, after the war was finished, she met an American Jewish uh, soldier. She married him. They moved to the States. And she got a present for her mother-in-law, Fanny's book. So with all these amazing testimonies that I uh, found in my way, I, I tried to create the background of Fanny's, uh, that, uh, of Fanny that I wrote in uh, this uh, book that uh, was published uh, in Hebrew in Israel. This is the all, uh, all of her book. And with the introduction uh, that I found out uh, a little bit uh, about uh, her activities, the background, uh, but there is more and more to learn about her. And my dream is to have Ivana one day a special seminar here together with researchers that, you know, research uh, Moravia and the Jewish life before and maybe, you know, together we will learn more about funny, about the time, about the period, about um, the understanding of women's uh, needs. Because funny, she is a pioneer. She is really a pioneer that has a lot of responsibility in her understanding that she needs that time to do a lot for herself and her generation, but more than that, to the generation after. And in the end, I found two testimonies in Yad Vashem. And when I called to the number that they left in Yad Vashem, nobody answered. But in Yad Vashem, I realized that her, uh, she had three children, and uh, her uh, uh, son-in-law and daughter-in-law and, and her son, uh, they, they were killed in the, in the, in the war, but... Um, but some of her uh, relatives, they gave testimonies to Yad Vashem, but when I found it, it was too late because uh, it was too, uh, too late. So um, I'm sure that there are a lot of knowledge around this area, place, uh, time, uh, that I'm not familiar with. And every meeting, lecture, I'm learning more and more about uh, Fanny uh, Noida. And the fact that she wrote this book here in this area, and as my you know, position now in the Israeli parliament, am I also the chair of the committee uh, the, uh, in the parliament, uh, the Czech parliament and the Israeli parliament, and I run a lot of activities together with our ambassador, uh, Gary, Gary Cohen, that helped a lot to create, but always I say to Gary and to my colleagues, we sometimes in life need to learn from the past and see the good relationship that we had in the past. And the fact that Fanny wrote this book here in this area, and you know that we sometimes start to think about common history just after the Holocaust. And I want to say and put again on the table the fact that we had a lot in common in the past, before, before the war, before the bad days. And sometimes we need to learn from the past and try to bring it back to our time. So let's read one more prayer. This, as I said, is the most popular prayer in Israel. Uh, Ivana, please, for a mother that her son served in the army. We have the translation uh, in the uh, church, thanks to Ludic's uh, word. Um, it's, yeah, for, uh, for a son serving in the army, it's number four. Zasina na vojně. Připá se jim meč svůj na bedra, reku udatný, pro každou stojnost a slávu svou. A v té slávě své šťastně výjížděj se slovem pravdy. A tvoje pravice dokáže mnoho. Nejmocnější veliteli nebeských šiků, panovniče nebe i země, k tvému sluchu míří volání mateřského srdce. Obrať ke mně svou milostivou tvář a vyslyš mě ve svém slitování. Můj syn, poslušen své vlastenecké povinnosti, 
narukoval do řad obránců naší drahé rodné země, aby ji a její obyvatele chránil před úklady a nebezpečenstvími a pomohl udržet pořádek a právo. Jistě je to ušlechtilá služba a já jsem, bože, vděčná, že jsme neobdařil tak stepilým dítětem, že je hodno chopit se zbraně a proto ho povolali a uznali schopným bránit vlast, ale mateřské srdce se chvěje a zmítá pomyšlením na bezpočet rizik a pokušení, kterým je nyní vystaven. Je mlád a doposud neskušený, navíc daleko od rodičovského vedení a napomínání. Jeho dosud dětské srdce je snadnou kořistí všem svůdným nástrahám. Snadno se může zpronevěřit věrnému výkonu své služby anebo upadnout do té nad hříchu. Proto tě všemohoucí otče úpěnlivě prosím, vezmi ho pod svoji ochranu a obklopuj ho aurou své vznešenosti. Ušlechtilým pohnutkám v jeho nitru dej vzkvést a zesílit spolu se vzpomínkou na rodičovské rady a napomenutí, které mu snad v srdci vytanou. Kež nikdy nezapomene, co jsme ho učili ohledně ušlechtilosti a vztahu k víře. Kež mu duše neokorá tvrdou službou ve zbrani a nezlákají ji svůdné hlasy hříchu. Ty sám ho ochraňuj, aby si prozíravě, sectí a s nasazením všech svých sil sa připraven a vytrvalý splnil svoji těžkou službu do posledního úkolu. Ať nepochybí, v ničem nesklame, Neselže, kež nepoleví v trpělivé, naprosto oddané poslušnosti ve své věrné loajalitě vůči vrchnostem a velitelům, na jejichž vlajku přísahal. A máli udeřit dokonce tak rušná hodinka, že by byl povolán do prostřed bitevní řady, kde smrt slavívá vždy bohatou žeň, milosrdný všemohoucí, budiš požehnán, obklop ho svojí milostí, buď mu ty sám štítem a pavézou, Zocel jeho paže a vlévej mu odvahu vzpomínkou na udatné reky dávného Izraele, aby dokázal kráčet do boje s nadšením a byl tak pro svou odvahu ke cti svému lidu a věrným služebníkem své vrchnosti a velitelů. Vyslyš mé prozby, pane, kež jsou mu má mateřská požehnání korouhví vlající na jeho skrání, korouhví, ke které se zdráv na těle a na duchu, navíc ozdoben důkazy uznání za prokázané služby, zase v pořádku vrátí k mé neskonalé radosti a pro slávu tvého vznešeného jména. Amen. Fajnojde wrote, uh, I think, spiritual things for all of us. She, she managed to allow the commonplace events uh, of our lives to be recognized as uh, moments of uh, transition, moments of joy, of sorrow, of fear, moments of happiness and sadness and of despair. Um, prayers for every day and prayers for every special uh, moments that uh, We, as Jewish people, are not that familiar with prayers uh, like this. And me, as a research and as a mother of soldier, that um, uh, I'm praying every day to hear from him. Uh, it's, it's not easy. Um, I feel a lot of uh, support in this amazing, amazing uh, prayer. And to think that this words was uh, were written uh, 1855 it means more like 160 years ago um, it brings back that yeah women women but uh, we are the same you know we are all the same and funny had uh, knowledge to write it for us and i try to bring it uh, back because we need words like this in our life, in our day. And for me, via this uh, work, I found that uh, women, uh, doesn't matter if you are Christian, Jewish, Muslim, I can share with you that after my book was published in Israel, I got invitation from a Muslim woman. She lives 
in uh, Nazareth, and she told me uh, that she wrote a book similar to my book, and she collects a prayer, wedding prayer, from uh, Muslim women in the villages and in the mountains, and same like me. She was very afraid to lose this knowledge. We used to think that women field is like folklore and men area is much more knowledge. Also in the academic, my dear. And you, I mean, can give, uh, I'm sure, a speech about it. I belong to a gender, the gender department at Boilani University. It took us a while to give the importance of this uh, department in Hebrew. Only in, in uh, 1998, the word gender, migdal, gender, was uh, translated to Hebrew. It took us a while to uh, convince the Hebrew Academy to give us a word because uh, gender is not sex and to, to tell them uh, the difference between, I remember the day that I wrote my dissertation and I used the word gender, migdal, in Hebrew, and I got it back. What is gender? So us as women and people that understand that, yes, we are equal, but this difference between men and women, there are a lot of knowledge to share and, and to have together. And I'm, I know that one day we will have more knowledge about funny and more knowledge to share to have a better future for all of us. So thank you very much. And uh, I know that you have a question, <laughs> so please. Aliza, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture, a very expressive lecture. And I hope we will have the chance, uh, maybe in one year and one day again, <laughs> to we, make We, the we were here, you know, before yeah. last year. We made a ceremony. I didn't even tell about the ceremony, so you maybe yeah. can share a little bit. I, also, I have introduced I it. I introduced it. Okay. This. And so maybe next year we'll do the seminar yes. before Rosh Hashanah. Because we will have a big annual of the synagogue here in Olomos and the Jewish community, so maybe this will be the great occasion okay. to do this workshop. Uh, vážené dámy a pánové, pokud máte nějaké otázky na paní Laví, prosím, uh, zahajme krátkou diskuzi. Pan Marom, uh, já vám možná předám mikrofon, abychom mohli tlumočit. Já doufám, že všichni slyšíte, ta otázka je, že v Evropě v hodně zemích byly ženy, pravděpodobně v rodinách, které byly tak pobožné, jako ve Španělsku, v Německu, v Polsku, v Rusku, v Litvě v v a tak dále. Jestli v těch ostatních zemích byl někdo jako tahle žena, která bojovala v boji, který dneska v Jeruzalémě ženy dělají. Ani Brit, ani, ani Šoel, by jim betocha v Karšelách, ne v Gašt, jim kufot v Sfarád, v Germánii, v Polánii, no, as I said, a funny, a funny was a pioneer. I mean, a pioneer of women's prayer. I, I found prayers that were written by uh, other women, as I said, Paula Bat Rabbi Avram in Italy, Frecha Bat Rabbi Avram in Morocco, uh, I, I, all the book, all this book, 
Jewish Women Prayer Book all together. It's a collection of uh, prayers that were written by women, but nothing like funny. Women that did it all by herself from the beginning till the end and wrote the prayers that you are familiar from the original Sidur, but also add uh, personals, personal prayers. And now, she, she, till now, I didn't find... Uh, was it because of Joseph II, who was at that time... I, I think, I mean, in the introduction she said that she didn't want to publish the book. She did it after she became a widow. Her husband died, she was 36, and she found herself with no status, no position. Her husband was the rabbi of the community, and I assume that they asked her to leave the, maybe the apartment, be, uh, and they call another rabbi. And a year after, she lost also her father. So, Maybe, maybe she published the book because she needs money. Maybe, I don't know. You know, it's just imagination. But from the beginning of the first edition that was published in 1855, you can see that every year, every year, uh, there were another edition, another edition, another edition. And what else I, I, I found? I found uh, the 10 years after uh, a rabbi that was a lawyer moved to the States and published Fanny's book to English without her name. And he put his name. Plagiat. And he put his name because he, I, I assume again, that he saw it as a treasure. He saw if Fanny's book is so popular, so I and it was before the legislation against the uh, um, creators' uh, rights. And I, I, actually, Dina Bernal told me about this book. I didn't find it in our library in, in Israel. And when I, back, I went back to the library and asked uh, um, my assistants there to find me this uh, special edition, he told me, Elisa, we don't have it. And in the end, I found Fanny's book in, in his name. I mean, uh, but ask me, how do you know? What's happened in Israel, in this amazing library, all the books that were sent to Israel before the Holocaust and during the Holocaust, were uh, the, on, on them they have a um, blue, Magen um, David? Uh, David uh, star. star, David Star. And this, this book, this book, when came to the library, the lady that opened it, uh, she was a Safonit, um, librarian, thank you, librarian in Frankfurt, and she moved to Israel. And when she saw the book, she was familiar with uh, Fanny's book in German, when, but when she saw this book in English, she recognized that this book was stolen by, from Fanny and in the name of this Lauren Rabbe. And she wrote in pencil handwriting, this bo book belonged to Fanny Noida. And that's how I found it. So now it's on the shelf together with the German, uh, German original uh, book and the plagiat and also uh, the Hebrew uh, translation. So you see, I mean, sometimes, you know, history is his story. And funny, as you say, and ask why she, she was, funny start her story, to write via her perspective, understanding and knowledge, write down um, what she uh, feel and think that, you see, this book is so popular and I try to bring it back to our days. What is the message going to do about Jerusalem? <laughs> oh, now we are going to open a discussion about the situation in our days, in between in this government. Uh, unfortunately, the ultra orthodox are sitting in the government. But Women of the Wall started 20 years ago when 
women in the Western world wanted to pray together with the Book of Torah and also with Talit and, and Tefillin. Most of them came from the States when they used to do things like that. And if you ask me as a research, I think that there, there are mistakes, and I speak a lot of, with some of them are my colleagues. First thing, they went to the Supreme Court. They didn't speak with the people of Israel. And even in Israel, their activities are, are, are not that popular, not even secular people are understanding their you know, activities. And many, many years of fighting between the government, the policemen, the rabbi of the Kotel, the women of the wall. And when I was nominated last uh, parliament, uh, I came to the Knesset, I became uh, a member of the Israeli parliament, and I uh, got the committee of uh, status of women. And I say to myself, oh my God, I see all this fight. I invite him to the parliament. I invite Nathan Sharansky. I invited uh, the policeman. I invited the rabbi of the hotel and then uh, other, uh, um, other officers from the government. And at least to sit together and to speak after 20 years of fighting, 20 years of fighting, why to do it like this? I understand them. But on the other hand, we have to work together. And in Israel, in the end, they decide to open a third arena for the women of the wall and for people that want to pray together, men and women. So thank God, now we have the third arena. It will be continued because it's not enough and it's not the way they want it, but at least it's one step to understand the changes in our life and to understand that communities, especially in the States, used to pray together, all the family, men, women. In Israel, we are not familiar, um, the majority are not familiar with this behavior, but if you ask my opinion, we have to understand the needs of the generation and to give a, an answer, to give opportunity and I try, via my work in the parliament, to bring our Israel to be the house of all the Jewish people in the world, concerning their way of conversion, who is Jew, and help the people that are coming back after many years to convert. It's not that simple as you really know and understand the situation, but when you have the ultra ultra orthodox in the government so you understand the situation uh, and it's all the way so unfortunately you see again the problems that we have in saturday and can we work in saturday can we and who will decide and why the minority decide for the majority but this is democracy and in democracy Sometimes, uh, but we are not going to speak about politics and about my party. No. <laughs> okay. Ah, the bat mitzvah. Do you identify any other family in the Jewish world in the United States, in the United States, or after family, this Catholic dream that died? Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting questions. Yeah, it's a... My question was whether she identified other funnies nowadays who are writing um, a prayer for women, uh, some of them uh, may be married to rabbi and part of the orthodox establishment and part of them are from maybe uh, uh, the women of the of the quota, but uh, are you identify such women who are now writing women prayers? It's become very popularity, and uh, almost every day I got prayers from all over the world uh, to continue my work. It's become very, very, very popular. I don't. I don't ask. It's not my uh, job to judge. It's not prayers from women. It's become very for and from, 
and it's become very, very, very uh, popular. I grew up with the understanding that um, it's not right to pray personal prayer. I didn't even know that um, women, men, used to pray personal prayer. Uh, but now as, you know, uh, woman that uh, mother, and I'm also a grandmother, I have two granddaughters, I remember my grandmother, and my grandmother, she came from Afghanistan 100 uh, years ago. And my granny used to pray by heart, personal prayers. Unfortunately, I can't ask her question now when I'm, you know, have these questions. But my granny used to pray her personal prayers. But I grew up in a system that told me that personal prayer is against Judaism. And in, thank God, in my, our generation, we, you know, bring it back and feel, and when you know it and you read it, even the, in the Mishnah, in the Talmud, in our sources, you see that the personal prayer is there. And more than that, if you're familiar with our prayer developed during the ages, so only, only, only in the ninth century, before that, nothing. Everybody were, was prayed by heart. There were no, uh, you know, uh, formal uh, prayer book. But the community, the Jewish community in Barcelona in the ninth century wrote a letter to the big rabbi in Babylon and asked him to help them because they said, we are looking for redemption, but you know, thousand years and nothing happened and we forget the prayers. Please write something, help us. And since that request, they write the, 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 uh, the, the, the prayer of the book, and they didn't add women's prayers. So this is the formal, but the informal area, we see a lot of work and trying to be part of, because the main problem, and still in our days, the main problem is the language, is the knowledge of the Hebrew language. And still in our days, there is a huge, huge gap between what's happening in the synagogue, everything happened in Hebrew, and even in our days, next week I'm going to be in Washington and I'm going to speak with Israeli that live there a lot of many years and Jewish people that, and when they go to the synagogue and are not familiar with the Hebrew language, and to pray in the most intimate moment with the Creator in the language that you are not familiar with is so difficult. And so why to go to the synagogue if you don't know and you don't understand what you do? And women had the privilege to do it, and they did it. They did it because they needed it, and they did it because they had the responsibility of the Jewish education, especially for the girls, that the community somehow forget them. Because to the boys, they, you know, the community had the responsibility to teach them at least one in lifetime, in, in the bar mitzvah. But when we speak about the girls, it's a totally different story, and you see who had responsibility to do it. Okay, so maybe we can continue with the discussions and questions afterwards in Kuluars because of the next program of the festival and also because of the next program of Aliza. Uh, thank you very much again for your lecture. Thank you.